Welcome back to the Stream Shop. I hope you got a chance to enjoy the Super Bowl. I did. And since you saw me last, I've been super busy fencing this puppy dog in. And in the last video, we completed the spiral part of our scroll called the volute. Well, the next step in completing our scroll and neck is to do the fluting. I want to say congratulations to you if you have been following along and you've made it this far. All the hard stuff is over. Take a deep breath and relax. No more tricky little tasks that could end in utter disaster should you slip. You have not only all the tools you need to complete your fiddle, but you have gained all the skills at this point that you need to complete your fiddle. We're working on the fluting, which wraps from the back around to the front of our scroll, and boy, it highlights it and it really makes it pop. We're going to be using three basic types of tools, an assortment of some of our gouges, Half round files are handy, and our trusty little knife blade. You're going to want a little scrap of wood that you can tuck in your scroll to protect the future peg box should you slip as you carve down this way. Make sure you mark yourself a nice center line to work from. Because I joined two pieces of wood together, the glue joint provides my center line. The way I like to flute my scroll is to begin with the narrowest part of this scroll here and then work outward from that in either direction using my quarter inch gouge. Now I'm beginning with my quarter inch gouge and I still need to be very careful to be mindful of the direction of the grain. We're just going to start by taking small pieces out and working my way to the point where it widens out so much that I desire a slightly larger gouge. If you're having trouble seeing as you work your way over the top of the scroll and around the back side, Elevate your piece with a block of wood and add some lighting to help you see better. Your scroll should start to look something like this. Now remember, we're just roughing this in. It's not going to be perfect yet. As we come over the top, our flute starts to widen out and our quarter inch gouge starts to take two different paths following the outside edge and the center line. Now that you have this kind of Y shape, start to take out the center of the Y. Still with the small gouge. I'm still using a quarter inch. Now I've changed to my 3 eighths of an inch gouge. And I'm working right down the center of this wider portion of the flute. We're just about done fluting the upper side of our scroll. What's left now is to finish the fluting down in here and that is best accomplished with this knife blade. With your small knife blade you can work from the outside in to finish your fluting. Once I'm done carving with both my gouge and my knife blade, then I come in here with my small half round file and clean up my tool marks there. And if you have a small scraper, those are really excellent for getting in here and cleaning this up. So now, let's flip it over and let's do the back side. It's pretty much the same deal for the back side of the scroll. Just like on the other side, we must be very mindful of the direction of the grain as we carve. Now I'm going to start this time 
with my 3 8 inch gouge both directions and then I'll graduate to my half inch gouge as I head down this way and maybe even my 3 quarter. Here I am progressing around the back of the scroll. I'm still using my 3 8 inch gouge and you can see I'm holding it very much like a pen. I've choked way up on it so I have tremendous control over the tip of the blade. Now that I'm done using my half inch gouge and even my three quarter inch gouge, I want to switch to my one inch gouge for the bottom part of this flute here. In this little valley, it works really well to carve across the grain to avoid chipping it out. And then from this lower rounded portion where we traced our quarter, I'm going to work kind of diagonally in towards the center line. As you work this little valley, just be careful and be mindful of your center line not to go over it. We call this area here the curb. So I'm working from the outside edge of what will be the curb, leaving my pencil line, working towards the center, just gently taking out some little curls here. I can safely work downhill from my pencil line towards the bottom of my little valley fairly safely. Now we come in with our scraper and clean up our tool marks and touch up that center line, get it nice and straight, as well as the outside line. And then up here, towards the top, you can use one of your half round files and get in there just like you did on the other side. Well, you did it. You completed a beautiful scroll. And the fluting is all done and it looks fantastic. And I'm really sorry, but the rest of your life is going to be anticlimactic from this point on. All right. There is one more thing we'll do before we're completely done. And once we finish the peg box and have carved our neck, we will put a little bevel on all these sharp edges all the way around. Well, it's time to start on that peg box we've been talking about. We're going to begin by marking out the boundaries for our peg box. The sides should be five millimeters wide. And the bottom of the box on mine is 144 millimeters from the end. Now you can take this, throw it on the bench and start carving away with your small gouge and your small chisel but I'm going to move over to the drill press and speed things up a little bit. I'm going to drill a series of holes in my peg box to remove wood using my depth stop to prevent me from going too far. Now I'm going to get in there using my small quarter inch gouge that I have been using all along. I'm also going to use my small chisel because I need nice straight sides and a flat bottom. 
In my first video, when I talked about some tools you might need, I mentioned a set of gouges I bought from Home Cheapo, I mean Home Depot. And in that little set was this one oddball curved gouge. And I modified it a little bit, and it is quite useful in this one task, hollowing out my peg box. I'm just going to start hogging out the middle first. Having these drilled holes is helpful, speeds it up a little bit. I got to be careful I don't slip out and stab my beautiful scroll. After just a few minutes with the gouge, I'm at this point and it's time to change to the chisel and start straightening out the sides. Square up your sides. I try to split my pencil line with my blade. Now I'm going to go down to the bottom of the peg box with my little quarter inch chisel. Square off your peg box about two millimeters below the peg holes you've drilled. And then take a couple of your small files and clean up the inside of it. Do you realize how close we are to being done? Boy, it's looking good. Our last task is to shape this neck. Now we already have this shape outlined right there. The next step is to decide how we're going to shape our button. Here's what a traditional button looks like. It's about the size of a nickel. And here's what I do. I call this my cathedral window. Make your button any way you choose. It's kind of part of your signature that this is your fiddle. Go online and see what other makers did. Maybe you'll get some neat ideas. Well, the next step in completing our neck is actually to whittle this or carve it to the desired shape. We're going to be using our knife to begin with. And the first thing we do is remove six corners. One, two, three, four, five, six. We take those down using our knife blade and start bringing this closer to the desired finished shape. So much of making the fiddle is enjoyable. And this has got to be way up there on my list. What I do is I keep rotating around my six corners and bringing it down little by little closer to the final shape. In no case should you carve over that center line. We want to maintain our thickness and we do not want to make it all the way out quite to this edge. We want to save a little bit for final shaping with the fingerboard. After about 10 or 15 minutes of carving, we're close to our final shape. Now the next step is to move to our small finger plane. The finger plane helps us get things nice and even and take down these high spots left from our whittling. We still don't want to touch this center line because we're maintaining a thickness. It's very important. Now what shape should your neck be exactly? Wouldn't it be nice to have a neat little template that helped you achieve the perfect shape for your fiddle neck? Well, let me show you how to do it. Grab a piece of paper or cardstock, draw a line 
then two parallel lines 100 millimeters apart. Take your template you used for your fiddle neck and lay it parallel with that long line. Move it over towards the left a little bit and then trace the shape of the neck there. Slide this over to the left, keeping it parallel and trace this shape here. Measure up 30 millimeters and strike a line. Then measure and leave a mark 25 millimeters in from this end and 70 millimeters in. Then take your compass and make yourself a 31 millimeter semicircle and a 26 millimeter semicircle. Just like that. Then cut it out on whatever material you desire. Now you have a nifty little luthier tool that you can use to make sure your neck is nice and flat and then you can check the curb and you can check the heel curve. What's interesting is I tried this on my fancy violin that cost a couple thousand dollars. Let me show you. Look how poorly carved this is. Now the heel's not bad, but look at the gap on the neck. Flat here. Oh, terrible. Just awful. Well, at least I know that violin wasn't made by some CNC machine. But gee, you'd think for a professional instrument, the neck would be at least straight. Well, anyway... My fiddle neck's going to be perfect. You can cut a template right out of that piece of cardstock. But this is a guide, okay? It's more about the shape of the neck than it perfectly fitting inside your little template. As we get closer and closer to our final shape, we use tools that take less and less wood off. Right now I'm using my two scrapers. Now for the curb and the heel, I'm probably going to get in here with one of my two half round files. We want to be careful of the center line because this thickness is very important. I marked on my little template what my thicknesses should be. It should be 12 millimeters right here and one millimeter thicker at 13 up here by the heel. I have my neck shaped nicely, just the way I want. Let me show you something. Here's that little neck gauge we made. Put it on here. Notice the neck isn't quite the right size yet. Good reason for that. Don't panic. Remember the fingerboard? We've got to get this to the perfect size. I've got my hot glue heating up. And we're going to temporarily attach the fingerboard so we can finish the neck. We need to have the fingerboard at exactly the right size at this point. 270 millimeters long, 24 millimeters wide at the top, 42 millimeters wide at the bottom, the ends nice and square. Okay, on the back side, measure down from the thin end. 145 millimeters, strike a mark, and draw a semicircle. We're going to thickness this larger end of the fingerboard like so. Four millimeters thick and four and a half to possibly five millimeters high on the sides. I have my external dimensions perfect. Now to hollow out the underside, I've already made my marks. And I'm just going to use my little finger plane and my scrapers. This ebony actually scrapes some planes very nicely. Just like any piece of wood, you still have to be mindful of the direction of the grain. My fingerboard is all done, hollowed out, thicknessed. I have a nice center line to work with. 
because I'm going to temporarily glue this to my neck. You may permanently glue it if you'd like and then when you apply your shellac or varnish you're going to have to work around the fingerboard. I'm going to pop mine off when I do the finishing work. It's real important to have this thing centered on the neck. There's my two drops of glue. And I get this thing centered and clamped. Now once the glue hardens up in an hour or two, I can finish the final shape of my neck. Well, now that my glue has set, and my fingerboard is firmly attached to the neck, I can do my final shaping. I have just a whisker to take off on either side here. And now I can use my little gauge and get the neck to its finished shape. Once I have accomplished that, I have some chamfering to do on these hard, sharp edges. A final inspection, and we can call this complete. I'm carefully using the file to bring the neck down to the right width. Being careful to watch for black shavings. I don't want to file down my fingerboard. As soon as I see some black shavings, I stop. Finish up your neck using your scraper of choice. Feel it with your hands. Remember to use lighting. Remember the artificial sunrise? It helps you see small imperfections. Then take your little gauge you made. Check your curb and your heel and the straightness of your neck. And then check the shape of your neck. Make sure you're right on target and you're happy with the shape. And now it's time to do a little cleanup because I know you got fingerprints all over this thing. So clean this up using your scraper, even a tiny bit of sandpaper if you have to, but don't tell anybody. And the last thing we're going to do is I'm going to use my small files and I'm going to chamfer the sharp edges and leave a little one millimeter bevel all the way around. Okay, boys and girls, I think I'm all done. See how the chamfered edges pick up the light. Very pretty. Well, we did it. We started out with an old cherry board, kind of crummy looking, and we made ourselves a halfway decent looking scroll and neck for our fiddle. And in the next video, we get to pull out that old corpus that we built. And we are going to assemble ourselves a fiddle. I'll see you then.